This is a six-month pregnancy. A painful crisis combined with an infection. Malaria, question mark. Every year across the world, malaria wreaks havoc. In 2010, more than 200 million were infected with malaria and almost 1 million died, primarily children and pregnant women. The most serious form is cerebral malaria, which provokes high fevers, convulsions, risk of going into a coma, and sometimes death. In Africa, malaria kills one child every minute. This health plague is transmitted by a single insect, the Anaphalis mosquito. For more than 50 years, researchers from all over the world have tried to develop a vaccine to prevent this disease. But the malarial parasite is of a formidable and elusive complexity. Today, however, a wind of hope seems to finally rise. Close to 60 candidate vaccines are being studied in the world. One of them is in the lead. Its code name is RTSS. It's the only one in phase three of the clinical trials, the last stage before marketing. This is to verify the vaccine's effectiveness on a large scale. The trials are immense, more than 15,000 children tested in seven African countries. In the autumn of 2011, it was in the United States that the first results of RTSS were revealed. Because the vaccine is being developed by the British giant GlaxoSmithKline, GSK, and by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, based in Seattle. Today I'm pleased to announce the interim results from the phase three trial of the RTSS vaccine. It prevented severe malaria in 47% of the trial participants aged five to 17 months. If RTSS continues to show a long-term effect, uh, then it has the potential to protect millions of children and save thousands of lives. The first results of RTSS weren't announced by a researcher, but by a businessman, Bill Gates. The founder of the computing giant Microsoft has become today the great financier of global health. His dream, to eradicate malaria from the face of the planet and to find a vaccine. His foundation, the richest in the world, has invested $200 million in the development of RTSS, in addition to 300 million from GSK laboratories. The next series of results concerning the group of infants is programmed for the end of 2012. If one day RTSS is commercialized, it will be two first-time scientific breakthroughs, the world's first vaccine against malaria and against a parasitic disease. It's also staged. It's very difficult to say if we're really at a turning point or not. In any case, we need the results to be confirmed. It's the first time we've reached this point. So we should be very glad and really celebrate what's been achieved, but also say, it's not over. We are really hoping um, at MSF that um, these vaccines are not hyped and that we don't exaggerate the effectiveness of these vaccines. But is RTSS the right vaccine to defeat malaria? Or are we heading for another failure? It's in Africa that we find the answers at the clinical trials. The inventor of the candidate vaccine, Dr. Joe Cohen, regularly visits the 11 African trial sites. In February 2012, he goes with his Belgian colleague, Johan Vekermans, to Burkina Faso, a small country in West Africa amongst the poorest of the planet. The researchers must soon inject a group of infants the booster dose of the vaccine at the medical center San Cami of Nanaro. Hello. Hi, hello, do. How are you? Welcome. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. We're happy to see you here. For the RTSS team, they must check the smallest details in the trials to make sure that everything is optimal and that nothing puts 30 years of research at risk. The scientists must be assured that there hasn't been a rupture in the sacrosanct chain concerning the cold, and that the vaccine doses are conserved at the right temperature between 2 and 8 degrees Celsius. 
You never had any deviations in temperature? Uh, yes, yeah, uh, during the very first delivery of the vaccines. In fact, we left the fridge open too long. That was all. And so you've lost some vaccines? No, 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 no. The vaccine tolerates slight differences of temperature. You can open the fridge door, but if there is any doubt about the specifications, well, don't use it. Yes. For the moment, there's nothing to worry about. No, but I'm simply verifying that you don't have vaccines other than ours here. No, 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 no. no. We don't have other vaccines. Today, we're on the home stretch before registering the vaccine. And we're all extremely excited. So this is where all the mosquitoes roam, is it? I started to work on this vaccine in 1987, so it's been more or less 25 years. I didn't give up. Myself and all my colleagues persisted. In the beginning, it was a collaboration between GSK and the researchers from the United States Army. They were interested in developing a vaccine for their troops. We were interested in trying to develop a vaccine that could be used in Africa, but also, if possible, for travelers. But very quickly, we realized that the vaccine was going to be very difficult to develop. For the researchers, developing a vaccine means identifying a molecule of the infectious agent which will allow the immune system to learn how to defend itself. But in the case of malaria, this is an extremely difficult task because this disease is caused by a parasite, a very complex living organism which feeds and reproduces at the expense of other organisms. The parasite Plasmodium falciparum, carried by the female Anopheles mosquito, changes its form and its genetic makeup at each stage of its life cycle. It is the most fatal species for man. When an infected mosquito bites a human being to feed on its blood, it transmits parasites, which in less than one hour will migrate to the liver. It's the first stage of reproduction of the parasite in humans, the hepatic phase. It's this phase that the RTSS vaccine targets. The parasites invade liver cells and multiply in a very intense manner in five to 10 days. Thousands of new parasites are liberated through the blood vessels. Then begins the second stage of reproduction, the blood phase. The parasites invade red blood cells and then multiply in one to three days. The red blood cell finishes by bursting liberating new parasites into the bloodstream and provoking obstruction of the capillary vessels which feed the vital organs. This is what triggers off the symptoms of the disease, leading sometimes to death. All parasites have developed mechanisms to escape the immune system, either by taking refuge within the cells or by changing their surface proteins very frequently which makes it very difficult to attack them using vaccine strategies. You know all the challenges that exist. The pathogen is a parasite, a eukaryote, that has existed apparently for 200 million years. So it's had the time to adapt and develop mechanisms to escape the immune responses. So in our vaccine against malaria, We've selected a protein called the circumsporozoite protein, or CSP, known to be protective in animal models. And we fused it to a protein of the hepatitis B virus. The idea was to create particles, because the particles resemble pathogen, so that in the immune system, an alarm is sounded. In a few days, a group of infants will receive their booster shots. Will RTSS live up to its promise? Will it be the first vaccine to successfully overcome the complexity of this parasite? Researchers from all over the world are endeavoring to find a solution. And it's in Bogota that we find one of the pioneers at the Colombian Immunology Foundation Institute. 
For 32 years, Dr. Manuel Patawayo has tried to develop a malaria vaccine. According to him, this discovery would be as significant as the discovery of the rabies vaccine. He is Louis Pasteur, my idol. When I was nine years old, I read a comic book called Louis Pasteur, Discoverer of Vaccines, Benefactor to Humanity. And the role of idols is to define a standard for those who come after so that they can try to go beyond it. Here are all the molecules of the malaria parasite. Amongst these molecules, we identify which is the fragment with which it sticks or adheres to the red blood cell or to the liver cell. So knowing the chemical structure of the fragment, we know what we have to produce. What happens then is, we synthesize the protein in large quantities. That's my previous vaccine, the SPF-66. In 1987, Dr. Patawayo raised great hope when he announced that he had developed SPF-66, the first synthetic malaria vaccine. He published the first clinical trial results on humans, which were carried out with a small group of volunteers. In 87 and in 88, they were the first two articles in Nature where he made this sensational claim, saying, my vaccine is more than 80% effective. So finally, I found the solution. I was in Africa, and for me, it was like a big bomb. And people said, oh, finally. It's in Leticia, in the far south of Colombia, that Dr. Patawayo carries out his experimental research. Because the Amazon rainforest is home to a species that is very valuable in the fight against malaria, autos monkeys. The advantage of this monkey is that its immune system is practically identical to that of humans. That's why he's very useful to malaria research, like with any other infectious disease. It was in this laboratory, which at the time was very, very small, that on the 26th of January, 1986, we discovered SPF-66. It's not only the first synthetic vaccine, but it's also the first multi-stage one, which acts on the liver phase and on the blood phase. Here, we noticed that SPF-66 protected the monkeys by 30 to 50 percent. Then we did the clinical trials on man. In Tanzania, the results were very encouraging and promising, 31% protection. Unfortunately, the results published in 1994 were not subsequently confirmed. New clinical trials were carried out in Gambia and then in Thailand, this time by Anglo-Saxon researchers. The effects of this candidate vaccine were weak and even non-existent. Hope for the SPF 66 vanished. People looked at him as if to say, where did he come from, what's he saying, etc. And I think, well, okay, perhaps it wasn't the right track. But he did try. I proved to be a bit premature to claim victory. And today, people are inevitably much more cautious. For the last 50 years, the search for a malaria vaccine has been a long series of frustrations, aborted clinical trials, and repeated disappointments. And yet the researchers have never given up 
on finding the Holy Grail. For the front-running RTSS team, they must today administer a booster dose of the vaccine 18 months after the first injection. Over 100 people are mobilized. The logistics of this are impressive, worthy of a military campaign. The project's vehicles go searching for the mothers and their babies in the villages to drive them to the clinical research unit. At Burkina Faso, exactly 1,281 children were selected to participate in the trials. Their parents had to sign a document stating informed consent. Before enrolling the women and their children, we must have their consent. And consent consists of explaining to these women the ins and outs of the study. So we made videos in the national language, taking into consideration that these women are illiterate. Like in the other 10 clinical trial centers of RTSS in Africa, the children are divided into two groups. To the young children, the vaccine has been administered on its own. To the infants, who were between the ages of 6 and 12 weeks at the time of the first injection, it is co-administered with vaccines of the expanded program on immunization. The pediatric vaccines recommended by WHO, the World Health Organization. Obviously, one of the goals is to have a vaccine that is also compatible with the vaccines that are routinely given to the children in Africa and in the endemic regions, diphtheria, tetanus, polio, etc. Okay? To be able to implement the vaccine by the same channel, if you like, by the same path as the vaccines of the World Health Organization's expanded program on immunization. In fact, it's a minimum package of vaccinations that must be given to a child from its birth up until a certain age. The package consists of several vaccines, and as they are mandatory and already implemented in these countries, we believe that if we use the same program, we can reach the maximum number of children. Are you impatient? Of course, of course, of course. Very, very impatient. What else would you like me to say? In Geneva, the World Health Organization has adopted a roadmap. Its goal, the registration before 2015 of a first-generation vaccine with a 50% efficacy against severe malaria and lasting more than a year. A group of experts is in charge of following the RTSS trials. So at the moment, we don't know how long that protection is going to last. We don't know if it applies in all settings equally. Um, we also don't have the full safety information yet. So we do not have all of the information really to make the public health decisions about these first generation malaria vaccines. We'll need to wait and see and, and look at those results. I, I don't think it's helpful to speculate at this point. If the effectiveness of RTSS is less than 50%, will WHO agree to officially recommend it? Is there not a risk that the WHO will be put under pressure? The economist Herman Velasquez directed the WHO Drug Action Programme for some time. In 2010, he left the organization after repeatedly denouncing the lack of independence in its decisions. Unfortunately, all of the decisions made today by the World Health Organization are not decisions made purely technically. They're made more and more with political, 
industrial and very often economic considerations and agendas. It has become an organization that to a large part is in the hands of the private sector. Up until seven years ago, 51% of the World Health Organization's budget came from public contributions from member countries. Today, more than 80% of the budget stems from private contributions, occasionally public, but that is for specific projects, resulting in the fact that fixing priorities to a large part escapes not only the general direction of the World Health Organization, but also the government bodies, such as the World Health Assembly and the Executive Council. I am now very pleased to welcome on behalf of the Health Assembly, Mr. Bill Gates, co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. In the spring of 2011, Bill Gates is one of the star guests of the World Health Assembly, WHO's legislative body, where the 193 member states' representatives meet once a year. It is rare that a businessman expresses himself at this podium, but the Gates Foundation has become the second largest contributor to WHO's programs, just behind the US government. I know as a leader of a health ministry, you have a very difficult job. You have many different issues, all of which are related to life and death. But I do believe that as you look at your priorities, running the immunization system well will emerge as something very, very important. Vaccines are an extremely elegant technology. They can be expensive, they are easy to deliver, and they can provide lifelong protection from disease. At Microsoft, we dreamed about powerful and simple technologies. Well, vaccines are such a technology, so they're one of the best investments we can make. Mr. Gates insists on the fact that he has no influence over the political decisions at the WHO. That's false. In the measure that Mr. Gates says, I'll give money to that, but not for that, he defines the priorities. Because tomorrow, the World Health Organization won't have the money to invest in such and such a disease, only in those that have money behind them, money that would have been given by the Gates Foundation. It was in January 2000 that Bill Gates created his foundation while the US Department of Justice brought an antitrust litigation against Microsoft. The computing giant was accused of using its quasi monopoly position to eliminate its competitors. Microsoft, the most powerful and successful company of the new age, accused of using and abusing its power illegally. It's a ruling that could affect Bill Gates, the man behind Microsoft, the richest man in the world. While Gates was giving his deposition in front of the American justice, he no longer appeared as the American hero, nor as the computer genius, but like an evasive man on the run. In America, no person and no company is above the law. Public opinion of Bill Gates wavered, and with it, the stock value of Microsoft and his personal fortune. The American magnate then transformed himself into a good Samaritan. He and his wife traveled to the poorest countries on the planet, boosting his image as well as that of Microsoft. Bill Gates officially stepped down from his position of CEO, but in reality was still the president and the largest individual stockholder. The man who wanted to dominate the world with his software was creating a new image of himself, that of the greatest philanthropist on the planet and possibly in history. The Gates Foundation is the absolute clone of the Rockefeller Foundation. The Rockefeller Foundation was founded in 1913 to put an end to the hostility of the Americans and Congress towards Standard Oil, which was accused of making illegal profits in appropriating land, etc., and especially in polluting the American environment. In those days, we called these giant financial corporations the robbing barons. With Gates, it's exactly the same. We have a huge corporation, which no one can stand because of its dominant position. 
At this moment, the only way in the US to put an end to these attacks and hostility towards the corporation is to create a prestigious foundation that is totally philanthropic. And public health is the ideal target for that. Nobody today remembers the lawsuit against Bill Gates. People only speak of his foundation. He has since become an idol. He's one of the great businessmen of our time, and he's certainly the greatest philanthropist of our age. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Gates! Thank you. I believe that someday in the future, all people, no matter where they are born, will be able to lead a healthy life. Far from the force of Bill Gates and GSK, some scientists are following other research leads and trying to catch up. The French Pierre Druil, who has for some time run the parasitology laboratory at the Pasteur Institute, has invented another candidate vaccine, the MSP3. He has tested it in Mali with Dr. Ogobara Dumbo, one of the great African leaders in research against malaria. Firstly, I want to extend our warmest gratitude to all the people of the village who participated, with perhaps also our apologies if there were at times too many samples taken from the children. It was to better analyze the product being used. Unlike RTSS, which targets the hepatic stage of the infection, the MSP3 targets the blood stage. It aims to destroy the parasite while still in the bloodstream, before triggering the symptoms of the disease. This is the stage that interests Dr. Druil, because his strategy is to study people who, with age, have acquired a natural immunity to the parasite after having been regularly exposed to it during their childhood. Out of a billion people who act as host to the parasite, there are only, if I can dare say, one or two million who die from it. So in fact, there are 99.9% .9 who live with malaria. So these people develop, despite everything, a gradual protective reaction which protects them. And it is this particularity that we used. It's a matter of understanding how this individual acquired this protection, and then to see how we can reproduce it. It's a question of putting it simply, giving a one-year-old child the same status as a 20-year-old adult by injecting one, two, or three doses of the vaccine. So we did a clinical experiment where we transferred antibodies from protected African adults to malaria-exposed children. This experiment allowed us to identify a defense mechanism which had not been previously identified. Thanks to this mechanism, we could identify the targeted molecule, MSP3, in other words, the vaccine. As a vaccine developer, I'm on my 12th procedure of testing candidate vaccines. I've seen all the candidates. We as Malians evaluated that what Pierre had here was a potential vaccine, in which the mechanism was of interest and was rather particular in relation to the others. So, we set up a clinical development system that convinced him. The first clinical MSP3 trials commenced in 2000. Phase one allowed us to verify the safety of the vaccine on a small group of children. But from here on, we must now pass on to phase two, verify its effectiveness on a larger group. Since 2011, 800 children have been tested in Mali on two different sites. The pediatricians in the program closely monitor their health, allowing the researchers to then determine if the candidate vaccine has reduced the malaria crisis or not. No, Nello. When the pediatricians suspect a malaria case, they systematically carry out a blood smear. 
A small blood sample is examined by the researchers to determine if the parasite is present in the blood or not. Can you show them if you have any cases? I have a case of parasites at hand. Is it Plasmodium falciparum? Oh, yes, they're beauties. Does MSP3 represent a more promising branch of research than RTSS? In August 2012, the clinical trials in Mali have been running for a year and must deliver their first results. The database has been given to the English biostatistician Paul Milligan to analyze, but halfway through, the results are intriguing. It looks as if the vaccine in one of the sites is reducing the number of malaria episodes by about 40%, which is quite a substantial um, effect. But in the other site, which is epidemiologically rather different, yeah. we don't see any evidence of protection at all. And so that is quite, quite puzzling. It's in fact, it's a little like a police investigation. So here we have to track down the missing details in one of the two villages. In one village it's clear, but in the other village we're lacking information. So now we have to turn to the Malian investigators. Pierre Drouy seems worried. He has just left the Pasteur Institute to create his own laboratory, VAC for All, so that he can continue with his trials. The development of MSP3 has cost up until now around 3 million euros, financed principally by public European funds. If the final results are not good, this will handicap his future search for funding. He must find an explanation and set things right. The moment when we inoculate the vaccine antigen is important. We realize that if you arrive in full transmission around the month of June, when the child has already been exposed to a substantial quantity of the parasite, the amount added isn't the same. So the lymphocyte population is fatigued. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, that's the case. We couldn't stimulate them. Just like a sportsman who has an accumulation of lactic acid, you need rest in order to boost them. If we manage to inoculate the three doses between January, February, March, for example, before the transmission season, we would have a better... We would have the same effectiveness. Excellent. The ideal vaccine would act independently of all these factors and would function under all circumstances. Absolutely. Things are now extremely clear. We've started with a formula that is the simplest. That means a very small, synthetically made polypeptide, 90 amino acids. It's really extremely small. With the additive aluminium hydroxide, which is the most common that exists, there are now 10,000 biotechnological possibilities to improve the reaction, whether it be a combination of antigens or the union of other proteins. Combining MSP3 with another protein to obtain a better protection against malaria, that's the strategy that another candidate vaccine is taking. The GMZ2, developed by a Danish researcher and being tested a few hundred kilometers from here in Banfora, south of Burkina Faso. It's the little brother. I was going to say the big brother. In fact, the MSP3 is one of the components of GMZ2, which target two parts of the same parasite. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. I was in Geneva yesterday with WHO's technical committee. The idea was to present the latest in the GMZ2 research. And they're all impatient to see the results, like us for that matter. In this race for a vaccine, the GMZ2 has today become the second most advanced candidate. Since 2010, it has been in phase two of its clinical trials on close to 2,000 children in four different African countries. Financed by Europe, the trials have cost up until now a little less than 10 million euros. Far from the $500 million claimed by GSK and Bill Gates for RTSS, its main competitor. I don't call it competition. I call it emulation. It's as if you're working for the same objective. Everyone wants to be first. 
and to be there at the finish line in the end. We take blood samples to see if the organism has an immune reaction to the antigen that he's just been injected with. We want to see at what level the antibodies are reacting. The first trials have demonstrated that GMZ2 generates in man a production of antibodies capable of eliminating the parasite. From this point on, in phase two, specialists in biochemistry and hematology collect all the information which will allow the researchers to determine the effectiveness and the duration of the vaccine. He has over 5,550 lymphocytes with 53%. In Banfora, close to 900 children are followed for two years. And as with all the other clinical trials, all their ailments are treated for free, even if there is no case of malaria. It is our responsibility as researchers working on trials because we don't know if the diseases which will bring the patients to us are linked to the trials or if the diseases are linked to something else. In the villages of Burkina Faso, the anthropologist Paul-André Somme investigates the families whose children participate in the RTSS clinical trials. He wants to know if they are well aware of what is at stake and what is at risk. They understand that people have come to help them. I was rather surprised myself because I thought it was the opposite. I thought it was the women who helped the program, who helped it to advance science and all that, and who were proud to participate in a trial that was going to make life easier for everyone in Africa and elsewhere. So it's this idea of receiving help that distorts the whole process. I have a question for Joe Cohen. In your first study with the volunteers, I thought that the RTSS vaccine was used with several adjuvants, but I noticed that combined with other adjuvants, its effectiveness was almost zero. So I'm wondering, is the vaccine not very dependent on the adjuvants? You are absolutely right. We also had to work on increasing the immune system responses. And we did this by developing adjuvant systems. It's another component of the vaccine. So yes, the adjuvants are very important to the eventual effectiveness of the vaccine. Concerning RTSS, I've sometimes spitefully said that perhaps the effect's only due to the adjuvant and not at all due to the parasite antigen. The vehicle, in my opinion, is not good. I mean, the molecules that were chosen are the first that were encountered. It's as if you said, I went to Paris and the first two people I met are the most important in the capital. It makes you smile. But it's exactly what we're doing. The first molecules that were identified in the genome of plasmodium became the most important. I don't know why, but it's just those we know the best. I don't like to talk about competitors, but I think Pierre is right. And what's more, it's proven that the effectiveness is no more than 40 to 50 percent, meaning the same as we obtained 25 years ago. 
This is not at all satisfying at this stage, because I'm sure you'll agree that a vaccine that protects only up to 50 percent is well below our expectations. Another thing is that two and a half months later, there was practically no effect. Anyway, in the last research paper, they themselves practically admitted for the first time that the duration of the effectiveness was an enormous problem. It's not enough. The effects have to last longer. The immunity for the smallpox vaccine, for example, is between 10 and 15 years, something else completely. It's just wrong to think that one particular product or one vaccine, like the malaria vaccine, is going to be the revolution that changes everything. Um, and, and particularly because this vaccine is, at best case, is 50% effective, um, it's just going to be part of a, of a solution. People should especially avoid thinking that because they're vaccinated, they no longer need to use bed nets, they don't need to do anything else. Well, that's where the challenge will lie. Avoid being too loud. For the results of the RTSS trials on infants. At the headquarters of the GSK laboratory, 20 kilometers from Brussels, this date is stamped in everybody's mind. Tension is mounting. The leading worldwide vaccine producer is already in preparation. For the general public, RTSS should be called Moskirix. Around 2015, we will be ready to produce 30 million doses of RTSS per year. We remain convinced that a vaccine that protects at 50 percent has the potential of saving hundreds of millions of lives every year. If it's a question of a vaccine that has the possibility of saving only 50 percent of the people vaccinated and one that has to be re-administered every year, then the problem will be financial. What will be the price of the vaccine? Because if 100,000 children are to die and we can save 50,000 of them, we have to do it. But what will be the cost? For a vaccine, as with a medicine, the question of price is closely linked to the issue of patents, that is, the intellectual property rights. This is a very sensitive subject that has radically changed since the time of the first smallpox vaccine. In this room is the man who made the vaccine, Jonas Salk. Well, uh, Dr. Salk, who owns the patent on this vaccine? Well, the people, I, I would say, there is no patent. This is... could you patent the sun? <laughs> The patented products are often much more expensive than others because the manufacturer has a monopoly on its exploitation and can therefore fix the price as he sees fit. In 1995, in the tradition of Dr. Salk, the Colombian Manuel Pataroyo decided to donate the patent for his malaria vaccine to the WHO on condition that they commit to selling it at cost in developing countries if the clinical trials were successful. ética de absoluta convicción que lo que nosotros hagamos tiene que ir para la humanidad, no para que se le abulten los bolsillos o el presidente de la compañía ande en cinco jets distintos, no. But the president of GSK does not really intend to donate the patent for his RTSS, nor to sell it at cost if one day it's marketed. If we set a precedent of not for profit, we could inadvertently discourage others from doing research into malaria or other neglected tropical disease. We want to avoid that, but we want to be responsible too. That's why what we will do is set a price which covers our costs of manufacture and generate a small additional return. And when I say small, I mean 5%. In what siglo is this señor? When the industry most rentable in the world, industrialized, is giving 1%. El crecimiento de Francia es menos de 1%. El señor se contentaría con un modesto 
eh, eh, lucro de 5%. Ninguna empresa, ninguna industria, ni el automóvil, ni la financiera, ninguna está dando esto. Despite the global economic crisis in 2010, GSK had a turnover of 32 billion euros and a profit close to 2 billion. The RTSS program could turn out to be very profitable. Because there are millions of potential customers and financing instruments such as Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. It's a partnership that created a huge market for vaccines in poor countries that in the past were neglected by the pharmaceutical giants because they were considered insolvent. Gavi's target is the 73 poorest countries. Since its origins, Gavi has now uh, immunized uh, more than a third of a billion children and has saved uh, more than five million lives. Um, our goals between now and 2015 are to immunize another quarter of a billion of children. So we had a very successful donor conference that occurred last June. We asked for $3.7 billion, and the world uh, uh, stepped up to the plate and actually brought $4.3 billion. We will contribute £814 million of new funding up to 2015. This we had very strong support from our traditional donors, the UK, Norway, many of the countries in the European Union, obviously the US and Australia, Japan. Well, of course, if tomorrow a malaria vaccine is proved to be effective, I'm absolutely certain that even many developing countries will use their public funds to vaccinate en masse their people. In such a huge, incredible market, we're speaking about millions and millions of people that would be vaccinated. It's the goose that lays the golden egg. La gallina de los huevos de oro. It was in 2000 that the Gavi Alliance was created, thanks to a certain Bill Gates, whose foundation massively invested in vaccination research. Uh, so I just want to thank everybody for this incredible milestone. Yeah, the magic... If one day RTSS is commercialized, thanks to Gavi, it can be widely bought and distributed in poor countries. Let's talk a little bit about what you're trying to do, Bill Gates. Do you hope that this sort of initiative will be what you're remembered for? I don't care to be remembered at all. <laughs> We're partnered with GSK on a malaria vaccine. So the advances in technology should not just be for the richest. They, in fact, we should tilt our work to help the poorest. I share, I share Bill's view to a large degree. I think yeah. it's public relations, isn't it? No, not at all. I think people expect in the West, whether you're in America or in Europe, people expect to see uh, pharmaceutical industries contribute to societies who are less well off. Thank you all very much indeed, thanks. For the boss of Microsoft, as well as of GSK, the discovery of the world's first malaria vaccine would be very positive in terms of the brand's image in public opinion, which also includes their customers and stockholders. The researchers also think of their image and are often affected by the Nobel Prize syndrome, even if they would never openly admit it. Very honestly and sincerely, I don't think about it. I don't consider myself like an extraordinary researcher. When I think of the researchers who have received the Nobel Prize, I know I'm a small fish. They are Nobel laureates. For example, Ronald Ross, who discovered the mosquito that transmits malaria, the Anopheles mosquito. And also Laveran, who discovered the parasite that causes malaria. I'm not obsessed by it, really not. If they gave it to me, it would be a pleasure. But if not, it doesn't matter. These decisions are up to Nobel Prize committee members. I respect them and like them very much. I think it would be good, and it would calm the situation, if you like, to not give the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the malaria vaccine. It would avoid excesses, so I don't even give it a thought. The 9th of November 2012, the second series of the RTSS results are finally available. But this time, strangely enough, it's not Bill Gates who announces this with great pomp. It's Dr. Salim Abdullah, head of the clinical trials in Tanzania, in a simple press conference by Tala. Last year, we reported the results of RTSS candidate malaria vaccine in young children. Efficacy against severe malaria was 47%. Today, we are reporting the results of RTSS vaccine given to infants. RTSS reduced 
severe malaria by 37%. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Our next speaker is Sir Andrew Whitty, CEO of GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, we would have liked to have seen higher efficacy than we've seen, of course. Uh, it's a little frustrating that we're seeing different levels of protection in different age groups. Frustrated is the right word. But you know, you can look at the glass half empty or half full. I prefer to look at it half full. Yes, I think one day RTSS will be commercialized and will be the first malaria vaccine in the world. There were lots of things that were done on the way. And the new hepatitis B vaccine, which has now been patented, calls for the same types of adjuvants from the same family, which were developed thanks to RTSS. If we want to go further, we could say that Glaxo played its part very well in attracting Mr. Gates's money to develop the adjuvants of which they now own the patents. We could go that far, and that would be quite Machiavellian, of course. It certainly wasn't their intention. Their sole intention was to bring aid to the African populations. It's not yet the end of the story. <laughs>